everyone and welcome. My name is Christine Kennedy and on behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement and McMaster Continuing Education, I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's Caregiving Essentials webinar, Who Cares About Caregiving in Canada? Tonight's webinar is a very special event to kick off the opening of the Caregiving Essentials course that will be available beginning October 10th. This is a free course available to anyone who would like to broaden their caregiving knowledge. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the land on which this webinar is taking place is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. At McMaster, we start our events with a land acknowledgement to show both respect to Indigenous peoples and their enduring connection with their traditional territories and its history, and as an important step in reconciliation. Um, before I begin, I should probably mention a few logistics about the webinar. For those of you who have joined us in the past, you'll know that we usually have a live Q&A uh, portion at the end. Uh, but with today's talk, we've had such an overwhelming response. So thank you, everyone, for joining us and for signing up. Uh, and we had quite a few, like almost 100, pre-submitted questions that Donna and Andre are going to weave those pre-submitted questions into their conversation, and we're not going to be able to take live questions today. Uh, however, the chat will be open to all participants, uh, so feel free to share any information that you have with other participants, but because it is a public forum, I would encourage you and, or be mindful not to put personal information in there um, because everyone can see it. Uh, I would also like to inform you of the closed caption feature. To activate it, please click on more at the bottom of your screen and then click live transcript and your closed captioning should come up. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel. So with all of that out of the way, now it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today's webinar, Donna Thompson and Andre Picard. Donna is a caregiver, author, and educator. She is the author of two best-selling books on caregiving, including The Unexpected Journey of Caring. Donna also facilitates our free online course for caregivers, Caregiving Essentials, that I mentioned earlier. And she is a co-designer and co-instructor of the Family Engagement and Research course. Both courses are course offered here at McMaster. Joining Donna tonight in conversation is Andre Picard, a health reporter and columnist for the Globe and Mail, where he has been a staff writer since 1987. He is also the author of six best-selling books. Andre is a two-time winner of the Columns category at Canada's National Newspaper Awards and past winner of the prestigious uh, Michener Award for um, Meritorious Public Service Journalism. He was named Canada's first public health hero by the Canadian Public Health Association and a champion of mental health by the Canadian Alliance on Mental Illness and Mental Health. He received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for his dedication to improving health care. Andre is a graduate of the University of Ottawa and Carleton University and has received honorary doctorates from eight universities, including UBC and University of Toronto. Andre has been a speaker for a number of McMaster events, so uh, we welcome him back and we love having him uh, speak. Uh, and finally, because we have two authors this evening, we will be giving away five of Andre's book and five of Donna's book. So we will draw the names after the webinar and we will let those winners know on Monday and um, I will uh, get the information uh, and where I should send those books. So thank you everyone for joining us. Donna and Andre, thank you for joining us and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Christine and welcome Andre. I mean, I, I am absolutely thrilled to be here with you in conversation this evening. And I can see in the chat that uh, everyone's so happy to be here and excited about um, engaging in a thoughtful conversation about family caregiving and especially what you can tell us about how the threads of your work and in a lifetime of really looking at um, picking apart what makes good health care and what has is bringing us to what some people might call a crisis of care. So, Andrea, I want to begin by asking you, you began your career um, writing about the AIDS crisis. And how did that work inform how you think today um, about 
family, illness, um, community, and how we as a society should support people with healthcare challenges in the context of the people who love them best. How do you think about family? How did you think then? And how did you, what do you, you know, how did that help you evolve your thinking? Yeah, so I think, you know, AIDS is really the, the arc of my career. It's what I started covering. And not for any specific reason other than that it was at that time that AIDS exploded. Uh, you know, as a young person on a university campus, and this was a big deal for, for, for young people, uh, the biggest uh, threat of, of all time. You know, 74 million people have died of AIDS and counting. So it's, a, it's an enormous, probably the worst public health disaster in, in the history of humanity. So it's a big story. Uh, I was lucky to get in on the, the ground floor to start covering this. And I think it really shaped the way I think about care. I don't, I, I'm not a medical writer. I don't write about medicine. I write about health and I write about policy. And AIDS really was, before AIDS, we in the media just wrote about medicine. We wrote about, you know, drugs and things that could treat people, things we did to people. AIDS really changed. It was the first patient revolution. Uh, it hit young men, uh, often well uh, positioned in society, people who were educated, who knew how to communicate, and they just didn't sit back and let people do things to them. That's what patients were supposed to do. They were supposed to be receptacles of care and be quiet. And AIDS changed that. AIDS changed it dramatically. It's a, it was a patient movement. Uh, there was really no care available at the beginning, so it was very political. Uh, there was a lot of stigma. There was a lot of family dynamics going on. A lot of people, these were young gay men. They were often rejected by their families. So it really had all the elements that I've written about over and over again over 40 years. So that it was a good training ground. You know, a horrific story, but as a journalist, something very, very informative. And I think everything I've done since then has been informed by, you know, just those really early encounters with people dying of AIDS, uh, just having that privilege of being with people. Uh, and it really is a privilege when, when people are sick, when they're dying, that they let you into your life. And as a journalist, we have to be, you know, really thankful and respectful of that. And I think that served me well. And now I write more about older people. Uh, thankfully, not as many young people are dying now, but uh, it's lessons that, that stick with you and hopefully, hopefully you learn from them. Sorry for that long answer, but uh, that's 40 oh, no. years. Jill. Uh, my <laughs> mind is is going, you know, with just uh, pictures in my mind of movies and even people that I knew personally who died of AIDS. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there were people who were dying and died of AIDS whose families abandoned them and in as as AIDS you know the terrible ep epidemic grew as you said that a movement to um push for research and um galvanize the gay community became very very powerful and those who supported them we saw um, that incredibly powerful response to to AIDS. But we also saw people who were abandoned by their families. And in contrast to people whose families surrounded their bedside as they went through this terrible illness. And, you know, counterpoint to that, we saw, as you wrote so well in your book, Neglected No More, we saw families who were not allowed to be with their loved one during the COVID crisis, the worst of it. And so what I'm interested in is your observations about what family means in illness. What is the, what is the difference, be, you know, between the, the, the patient with a family and the patient without a family and what should be our collective response to your answer? Well, let me start with that. In journalism, we love anecdotes. Uh, one of the first stories I did uh, when I worked at the Globe was one of the stories that's touched me the most, that I remember the most over the years. I talk about it in my second last book, I talk about it in the introduction. Uh, I went into a hospital. This was early in the AIDS crisis. There was a lot of hysteria. People were afraid of catching AIDS from talking to someone who had AIDS, et cetera. Uh, and there was a man who was in the hospital in downtown Toronto, and the caregivers were afraid to, to treat him. 
It was in a room. They actually put a sign on the door that said radioactive, stay out. You know, there's a lot of stigma. And I went in to, you know, his uh, partner had called and said, you know, you have to expose this horrific treatment. I went into the hospital. I went into his room. And I, as I do, I went in, I introduced myself and I shook his hand. He burst into tears. He said, no one has touched me for days. You know, and it was so, it, it really, that's something so impactful for me, just the realization of what little things count in healthcare. And that's an example of how family counts. Families there giving you comfort. That's as, that's as important as the medicine. For him, it was much more important, just someone touching him, recognizing him as a person. And I think uh, to bring it forward to COVID, I wrote, as you know, many times about this policy of locking out families. And I think it was well-intentioned, but it was horrible. It was very ill thought out. Uh, families, no one in the world would have been more careful with their loved ones, but they were necessary. We know that you, you can't survive in long-term care without outside help anymore. There's just not enough paid help. And to lock people out, especially people with dementia who didn't really understand what was going on, it was, it was just downright cruel. And I think it did I think it did accelerate the death of people. We know the impacts of loneliness. Uh, we know that being lonely is the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. We know that on your on your body. Uh, this has real effects. And, uh, you know, we just saw that repeated over and over. Uh, who will ever forget seeing those photos of people standing at the window with, a, you know, a, an older woman with dementia looking like, why? Why are you abandoning me? It, it would just... It was crushing to see those images and it never should have happened. You know, we should have had PPE for families. Families were willing to take risks. You know, it's better. Everybody knows it's better to spend some time with your family and die a little earlier than it is to die alone. That we know that and people should be allowed to make that choice. So I think this is a poor policy choice and it speaks to not having enough of the, the family voice and the patient voice in care. We still do what we did a hundred years ago. We do stuff to people instead of with them. Yeah. Well, that's, isn't that the truth? I'm, you know, um, do you think that we will ever in our lifetime or maybe the next generation see a lockout of family again? Is, is this going to repeat itself? Do you think, or are the lessons learned from um, the deaths in long-term care from, you know, lack of care. Uh, many people died of dehydration and, um, and starvation um, and loneliness. Do you, are you worried that such a terrible um, thing could, could happen again, such a response would be repeated in a public health crisis or, or, or is the idea of an essential family caregiver in healthcare, solid enough now that we don't have to worry about that? Well, I would like to think that it's never going to happen again. But I also know, having written about healthcare for a long time, that we very rarely learn the lessons uh, that we need to. If we had learned lessons, uh, COVID would not have been as bad. Uh, everything we needed to do to prevent uh, mass death from COVID was in the SARS report from 15 years earlier, and very little of it was implemented. So sadly, uh, we have very short memories. And we repeat errors over and over again. But hopefully there will be some uh, family memory, some collective memory, uh, institutional memory that uh, prevents us from ever doing this kind of thing again. Again, uh, you know, I don't blame anyone. It was well-intentioned, but good intentions uh, are not always, uh, don't always give good results. No, it, it strikes me, you know, I had a really interesting conversation in one of um, this in, in another webinar in this series with um, Brian Goldman about his book on teamwork. And I wanted to probe this idea of family members being on healthcare teams. And he was very open talking about his own sister and being worried about um, suctioning her in long-term care and worrying that he was going to get kicked out for that because nobody else was available to suction her. And, you know, this idea that um, in some way, you know, it's, it's, it, it's really weird how healthcare systems and people that work within them seem to pretend 
that they don't need families, that there is a healthcare transaction taking place that is between the healthcare provider and the patient and doesn't involve anyone else who isn't a professional. And then, so then we went through COVID and then we became um, families, I mean, had a designation of essential family caregiver, even in Ontario hospitals with a lanyard and identification and full PPE, which many of us really welcomed. But then we began to worry a little bit about what are what are the unintended consequences of being professionalized as a mother, daughter, sister, brother? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it's something that I, I have mixed feelings on that being a team member. I, you know, I think we have to respect families, we have to live them, but I do worry that we dump too much responsibility on families and it's not fair. Uh, I also worry that people don't have adequate training. You know, I'm very, one of the reasons I want to participate tonight is I think this program you're doing is so essential. You know, having been a, a family caregiver, I know that th this stuff doesn't, uh, we don't learn it by osmosis, right? The first time you change a confidence pad is something you never forget. And uh, the first time you bathe someone with dementia, you realize this isn't uh, this isn't a given. We all take baby courses, right? Everybody takes parenting courses now. Everybody should be taking eldering courses or whatever word you want to use. And that's not to infantilize people. It's to be a, the reality of our, our society is people live a long time. And we owe it, I think, to our family members to to have the knowledge, to, to, to help them out. And everybody would benefit from that. So I, I'm really happy that this kind of course exists, but really, should really be the norm. Like, who doesn't take a parenting course anymore? So maybe we should call it a grandparenting course. I don't know what the proper wording is, but that, that's the kind of stuff we have to bake in. And then you can be part of the team, but you also have to always have the option of being family member first. I don't want people to be, you know, the, the person who gives you the needle so your your dad doesn't like you anymore. That We have to be careful to, to respect those lines that people are family first and not dump these professional responsibilities on them that alienate them from their loved ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been in, I, you know, personally, I've been in, in the position where I've had to hold our son down for painful procedures. And that was a terrible, terrible thing to go through. Um, you, you know, you don't even know how to look at your child after that, you know, because you feel a deep that you've betrayed something that is very sacred, that is a trust between two people who love each other so much. So, yeah, I mean, um, on the other hand, I hear from so many caregivers that there is no one else. There's no one else. There is no professional to do these tasks. And um, I think many people feel that they don't have a choice or that um, that there is no way to advocate that isn't going to make things worse, that the systems will come back and consider you persona non grata or something like that. And these things do happen too. But Andre, I want to ask you, um, I hope this isn't too personal, but you alluded to your own family caregiving a minute ago. And I wonder if you can tell us about that and how your own family caregiving um how did that really influence your thinking about healthcare and about the positions you take on policy change and on the social contract between fa patients, families, and the world at large in Canada? Yeah, so to give you a little background, my uh, mom had COPD, and then that gradually, because of her uh, lung heart condition, she had these little TIAs, mini strokes. I ended up with vascular dementia. So that was her journey. My dad uh, had fairly early onset dementia in his late 50s and lived a long time, but most of it in the nursing home. So I always say my parents' illnesses were my education. Uh, mm -hmm. The best education in healthcare you could imagine and one that I wish on no one, right? So it's kind of, again, this mixed blessing. Uh, I was, I have to say my caregiving was mostly from the distance. Um, I didn't live in the same uh, town uh, 
in as my my parents, but my brother did. And my brother works in the healthcare system. Uh, that was a real benefit too to have him there. So he did that. He did the heavy lifting, literally and figuratively. And I was there being, uh, I, I sort of the pain in the ass back up because I do know the system. So that you need a little bit of both. So I think families have to find uh, their niche. So I think, yeah, the, the education part was really, really important for me. And I think it makes you realize this when you're from afar, uh, you understand things differently, the frustrations, uh, you appreciate your siblings more, I hope. You know, there's a lot of family dynamics that come into this that are are very complicated. And of course, I, I'm older, I have family members, you have all manner of uh, family conditions that have, they've gone through. And, and you learn from all this and you uh, in my position, people always call me for advice and stuff. I'm not always good at giving it, but I, so I, and people uh, in my work do share their stories with me to uh, a shocking degree. Sometimes they, people will, will overshare, but I, again, as I said earlier, that's a real privilege to be able to hear people's stories and you try and be respectful and, you know, not uh, respect their privacy, only write uh, what's necessary and basic to, to tell the story. But uh, yeah, they, that's an education that people are going to get. But I'd like them, uh, you know, I come back to the training. I'd like people to know this up front, what they're in for. Because uh, so much of this I hear from so many people, it's just such a shock, right? Like all of a sudden, yeah, you've got a healthy mom and she has a stroke and life is never the same again for anyone in the whole family. And this, this is the reality for so many people where you have a child, uh, the child is born with a disability or has an accident. Things happen and you people have adjust, adjust. And I'm always, you know, I'm amazed by the people I talk to, their resilience, their strength, uh, their caring. That's that's what most people are like. People do remarkable things and they do them quietly. And we don't we don't honor that and we don't respect that. Yeah. Oh, it's so true what you're saying. You know, I I I go on these um family caregiving support groups on Facebook, mostly very often, every day, multiple times a day. And um, I'll never get over this one woman wrote. Um, she said, you know, I was doing so well, propping up my mother's perfect fake independence until last Thursday when she broke her hip. And that just like says so much about you know, describing what you just said about how it comes at us, it crashes into us, these responsibilities that we have no training for, we're not prepared for. And it's not even, it used to maybe be in the cultural um, practices of how we are in family. We don't, we, we are kept separate our culture in some way has been sanitized. I think like we don't um, do our own death care. We don't, um, we don't even do that for pets. Like what the heck? We don't know very much about the nature, the natural ways of aging and looking after people who are ill. Um, and, and maybe we don't even necessarily know what comfort looks like. And I'm not sure of the answer. I think for sure, like I am the greatest queen bee for training. I really love the idea of training and I love it that it's free uh, through McMaster continuing education as it should be. Um, but I wonder if there's something else that we need to think about doing in our families to, to begin to change um, the, the way we look after each other and the sense of responsibility we should feel for each other. Because often I think people think, well, I'll just hire somebody professional to do that. And that's a big surprise when you need somebody. There's nobody home, nobody there. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I, I think I always say to people that it's a bit of a cliche, but I, I really think the most important conversations we have to have are at our kitchen tables. We have to sit down and talk to our parents and our grandparents while they're well about what do you want? What what do you want to do? Like I, I was lucky, uh, well, lucky in that my father got sick at a very early age. And that, you know, I read about this stuff and I wasn't better than anyone else. We were totally unprepared uh, with this realization that he was uh, descending into dementia at an early age. But 
I corrected that for my mom. You know, we sat down. And, what happens if you have a stroke? What happens if you have dementia? What do you want? And you talk about it while people are healthy. And that's so, it's actually freeing for the caregiver. Because one of the hardest things is to, you know, my dad's, you know, was not really there anymore. What does he want? I have no idea. I never asked him. It's liberating to do this, uh, to talk about death openly. You know, people think that older people are afraid of death, and they're not. They're afraid of being abandoned. They're afraid of suffering. But they're not afraid of death. And if you let them have these conversations, it's so, I've had these conversations with people and it's really enlightening and it's liberating. And I, I think it's really important. And the other part of the answer I want to add is, you know, you talked about culture and how we used to do this. I think we have to be careful about not romanticizing the good old days. You know, oh, I always, yes, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I always say that, you know, people who think there were good old days weren't there, right? Because, yeah, people, you know, we, my grandfather was displayed in the living room and we all gathered around. That was lovely. But, you know, he had terrible medical care. Uh, and, you know, he had a family of 17 children and only one of them was there to care for him. There's, there's downsides to the old days as well. So I think let's do it in a modern way. We have to adapt to the reality that kids often live 3,000 kilometers away. So how do we adapt to that? We have to, what can the person who's afar do? Uh, they can contribute money. They can be on the Zooms. Families have to figure this out in, in a modern way and not pretend that we should all live in the farm and, you know, take care of grandpa. That, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Oh, uh, really good point. Which brings me to a question, and I'm going to get to some of the questions that people sent in in, in just a minute. But, um, you know, you're talking about your family and um how liberating and and empowering for everybody it is to have a conversation about the things you want and you don't want if you become in, incapacitated or have a serious illness or a you know a terminal diagnosis so i am 68 and i've been thinking a lot <laughs> a lot um recently about what i want and how do I want to age, especially because I've looked after so many people in my family and I've seen what I like, what I don't like. My husband is a little bit more reluctant to maybe get into the thick of these discussions, but I... Boys will be boys. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I wonder, knowing everything about healthcare that you do, what do you, how do you want to plan your older age uh, have you thought about it and um are you aware of some good practice that is going to be easy maybe on your other your kids your family members on yourself um you know i think i'm like everyone else i have a certain vanity i'm always going to be healthy until i die right that's what we all assume but uh, more seriously i've just sat with my children and said you know this is what i want uh, I don't want, you know, I don't want excessive care. I want this kind of funeral. Just talk about that. You know, they, they were around when their grandparents died. And, and I hope that lesson's been conveyed. But also, I don't want to put too much of a burden on them. They're so young, right? So I just want them to know the basics. But, and, you know, I say to them, you know, it'd be great if you can care for me. But if you can't, that's okay. You know, that's why we have money in our wills. And hopefully there'll be some for me. And if not, dump me in the crappy public system, that's fine. You know, I, I don't want them to, to have the guilt or whatever. But again, I think that the most empowering thing we can do is just talk to them that it's not some secret. I'm not going to live forever. You know, maybe I'll have dementia like my dad. And if I do, you know, you have to adjust to that, but you don't have to give up your life either. And I talk to them too. If you have kids, maybe you have a kid with a disability. You should think about that. That doesn't mean you should have not have them but you should be prepared for that. That's a reality. And I, I think it's just these honest, frank conversations are, are the most helpful thing so that people aren't just, they don't have this dramatic surprise and their life is turned upside down. And that they see, you know, I do, as you know, I know lots of families with disabilities. This is another issue I write about because it, it informs the broader system. If we can, uh, you know, if we can't take care of the most I don't want to say the word needy, but the cases where that are in the most challenging, if we can't take care of them, we can't take care of anyone properly. So you have to focus on the, on the hardest cases. And that's why I like to write about them. They're challenging, 
But, you know, people with disabilities, people with dementia, they have great lives. You yeah. know, I, I always remember uh, doing a story about a, a caregiver many years ago. And we went and I, I went and lived in his home for several days and he was taking care of his wife. And I was there around the clock. And, you know, she was up in the middle of the night. It was challenging. And he just, I just remember this one thing he said, a quote always stayed with me. He said, you know, I said, why do you do all this? It's so hard. You're exhausted. You don't sleep. And he goes, you know, she's a lot of good company still. You know, she's still there. She's still my wife. I see the real her. I have little flashes and that's worth it. And you realize people, people do have good lives. They're not maybe what we expected, but that's, to me, that's ultimately what healthcare is about, that everybody live to be their abilities, whatever those, that level of ability is, we should aspire to that. That That's what it's all about. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm interested in one of our, our great questions that came in, we have so many interesting questions, but one of them was, Andre, you've done a lot of research internationally into different systems. And can you tell us um, maybe when you were most surprised and delighted with something you saw that you thought, wow, this should be everywhere in terms of healthcare and in terms of, um, again, the ways that it would, that, that those systems um, affect family life. Yeah, I think I'll preface it again by saying, you know, there's no perfect system, but we can all learn from each other. We can all learn lessons from other systems. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of people have said this and I agree with it from what I've said. I think a country like Denmark is kind of the gold standard. And what yeah. do they do? They don't do anything magic. You know, they're not, you know, better people, et cetera, but they just think of uh, older people as part of society. Like it's a fundamental, it's a cultural issue. We want older people to live among us. And then their policies reflect that, right? So there's not a lot of long-term care homes in, in Denmark. There are, but they're small and they're home-like, you know, a dozen people, 20 people living in it. It's not like an institution, it's like a house. Uh, you see 90-year-olds riding bikes because society is designed for that. Uh, when they build care homes, they build them beside a daycare. Why? Because they want children to interact with their elders every day. These are just little things. Uh, I went to Finland. In Finland, there's a law that every nursing home resident has to have a window and access to the outdoors. Seemingly simple thing, but such an important thing for your quality of life. So there's all kinds of these things and we do a lot of these things in Canada but we just don't do them universally is the problem and the other thing a little add, I'm sort of watching the chat and I'm sorry about the sound I, I know my sound's a little clunky I usually have a microphone and I broke it and I'm on the road and I, I unfortunately if I was home I would have a replacement but uh, I apologize for using my computer mic I'm trying to speak up but I'm not normally a loud talker so sorry we can hear you absolutely fine. It's perfect. I know some people are having trouble, and some and with as someone with bad hearing, I I doubly apologize. Okay. I wanted just to um, ask another question here. Um, Lana asked, "How do we advocate for mandate and policy for health providers to recognize and partner with family caregivers?" Do you think this is something that medical medical schools should be teaching? Or do you think that um, the Ontario Hospital Association is now, you know, has this essential family caregiver policy in place? Do, ha, to what extent do you think we should regulate um, the way that healthcare providers interact with family caregivers? Yeah, I'm not a big person on regulation. I think what matters more is culture, uh, learning about things. Uh, policies are all great on paper, but if you don't, if you don't believe them, if you don't live them, they're not useful. So, what do I believe? I think that in med medical school, every uh, and this happens at a number of medical schools now. I believe at McMaster it does, but we used to at the beginning of medical school assign everyone a cadaver. Right, so they can learn how to cut them up and, and stuff like that. Very important, and uh, that 
that is very respected. People are very respectful of their cadaver. They have ceremonies to to honor them and stuff, and that's great. But I think every med student should be assigned an elder and, you know, just take care of them. During their four, three or four years of medical school, you should be on call. And there's a couple of schools I know that do that. And there's no better learning tool than a, a real person. Uh, you know, you, you've been assigned to this 95-year-old and they can call you and say, I don't know how to get to my doctor's appointment. And your job is to, to solve that. It's not to say, it's not my department. You can do that when you're a doctor. But when you're a medical student, you say, well, I'm going to go get you and I'm going to bring you on the bus, even though I have an exam to study for. Because if I don't, I'm going to fail because you're my number one response. That's how you teach things. You don't do it by writing long winded policies that people are going to shrug off. You do it by making this real for people. And, you know, the students I've talked to who are assigned someone like that, they become very, very close over a number of years. Uh, often they, you know, the lifelong friends, they end up at their funerals years later. That's, there's nothing more impactful than that, than just a dose of reality. Especially yeah. for, you know, the 22 year old, that, that mm -hmm. opens your eyes. Yeah. Oh, oh, I know. And I, I have just been advocating to no avail uh, for so many years about putting a, uh, a home rotation, home care rotation into med school, because as we know, so much of healthcare is delivered in the home. That is the environment of, of health. And um, so not, and very few physicians make home visits anymore. So there it's, you know, it's, it's part of that, uh, well, why aren't you taking your medication? There might be just a reason in the house that I don't, you know, that isn't working and causing non-compliance or whatever. Um, so I also just am skipping around because we have so many questions here. Um, yeah, about the healthcare labor shortage. Um, this is the healthcare labor shortage, as we know, the crisis of um, paid care in cl and clinicians and everybody in healthcare um, is having a huge knock on effect on the burden of care for family caregivers. What do you think we can do about the shortage of care? Yeah, I think first of all, we have to realize it's not going to be solved easily. We're we're out of labor. That's the reality. We're not going to magically create more people of an aging workforce. Uh, people don't want to do these jobs, especially uh, like the personal support workers. Uh, they're all going to places like McDonald's because they get better pay, uh, better work conditions, etc. So the reality is we have to figure out how to do it with less. And it's not going to be easy because there's not enough now. So I think a lot of it is we have to make sure that every uh, health professional works to their full scope of practice. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to make sure that uh, I, I was just at a conference today of physicians uh, talking about the, the administrative burden. So doctors do roughly 12 hours a week of paperwork, mm -hmm. all stuff that could be done by someone else. Imagine if we every doctor did 12 more hours of work, actually seeing patients, and somebody else did that work. And in this case, it could be an AI bot, it could be a person, but that would free up almost 600,000 visits. So that's just one example, right? We we have solutions out there. So it's doing care more efficiently is what, what we have to do in the short term because we're not going to magically create uh, more doctors. Uh, we have to be a little smarter about our policies. Uh, currently, there's a been an edict that uh, family medicine is going to have an extra year of yes, residency. Yes, that was so came gonna out. Delay. That's going to delay the entering into practice of thousands of doctors for no good reason. That's not going to make them better doctors. It's going to make them better students. And we don't need that. We need them to do, like you said, we need uh, family med medicine residents to do more interesting and varied things. We need them to go to reserves. We need them to do home care. We need them to go to nursing homes. We don't need them to sit in a classroom for another year. So don't make policies that make things worse is one important one that I, I don't think our policymakers has, has sunk into them. And then I think I think there is going to be more burden on families. So then the question becomes, how do you do that? Well, we have to be more supportive of them uh, financially and otherwise. So training, 
I'm a big, big, as you know, big, big advocate of training people because they're going to have to do it anyhow. So they might as well have skills. Uh, we need to give them tax breaks. Uh, you know, we have to have programs like we have a wonderful, I, I'm a big fan of the government's $10 a day daycare. Mm. But as I wrote when they introduced that policy, wonderful policy, but where's the $10 a day elder care? The reality is that more women in this country care for their parents than care for their children. That's the demographic reality. So where where's the support at the other end of the spectrum? So our policies have to be more thoughtful and more forward-looking, and they have to be grounded in the demographics of today. Uh, sadly, we have a healthcare system that's built for caring for young, healthy people. You know, it was fashioned in the 1950s and during the baby boom, and it wasn't fashioned for the the baby boom plus 65 years. And that's the reality. We got we got to catch up with the the demographic reality. And I'm not someone. I'm not catastrophizing aging. I think aging is a wonderful thing. It's a, that, you know, we should be celebrating the fact that people are living to 100 now, that centenarians are the, the fastest growing demographic. That's wonderful. It's not a catastrophe. The catastrophe is that our, we're not adapting our policies to reality. Yeah. Oh, boy. So well said. Um, you and I are both, um, I, I think, uh, big supporters of the new new-ish, um, Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence. And um, I'm an advisor there, and we have uh, a really exciting summit coming up in Ottawa, November 6th to 8th. And I'm delighted to say that you are uh, the keynote at that summit. And I wonder, um, I think uh, Christine will put the link to the summit um, in in the chat, and I hope everyone will register. It's highly uh, subsidized, so it's not expensive to attend, and there will be a hybrid um, online uh, version. It's very, very affordable as well. Um, but the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence is working very hard um, on a political advocacy strategy to try to get a national strategy for caregivers in Canada. And I would love to hear your thoughts about what it would mean to bring together disease associations across ages, across abilities, begin to think about autism and aging and Parkinson's and stroke, um, all of all of these associations and disparate groups, disease specific groups together with the one thing they have in common, which is family. Do you think there's an opportunity for significant change about reconceiving um, the kinds of support that people get from turning it into something more non-specific than say a disease? Yeah, I think there's definitely uh, room for more networking, for more cross-pollination there between groups. You know, in Canada, we have a lot of healthcare groups, but they, you know, we kind of call them in the media the, the body part groups or the disease groups. Everybody is very siloed, and, and there needs to be that focus on, on the caregiver. Uh, there also needs to be the focus on the patient and families. We don't have strong... Uh, like uh, countries like France, the patient association is as strong as the physician association. In wow. Canada, we don't even have a national patient's voice. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a voice for, for families. We have all these little tiny groups locally, which are important, but we don't have that powerful voice. So I think that network is important. Uh, strategies I'm less enthused about. You know, we have strategies for all kinds of things, and they don't serve any purpose because they're not funded, and they're not, people don't buy into them. They're just cobbled together by academics and, you know, dumped on people and families go, yeah, I don't have time for that. You know, families don't have a lot of time. You know this. Yeah. Uh, they're busy. So you have to do it. You have to do stuff that's going to help families rather than give them more work. So I think that voice is important, but we have to make sure that it, it not just be tokenism. You know, we see that uh, in places like nursing homes. They have, some have family councils. But to me, if you're going to have a family member on a board of some sort, they have to be an equal. They have to have a vote and they have to be paid to be at the table. You know, I go to these meetings and all these people are getting their $200,000 salaries 
and then they have the patient volunteer. That, that doesn't work for me. We have to respect this disrespectful to not recognize the, the value of their time and their their knowledge. So we have to we have to if we're going to be serious about it, we have to put our money where our mouths are. Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, and I wonder what you think about these, the idea that's being floated around many places today of paying family caregivers to provide care to in within their families, particularly if they have to leave uh, the workplace. I, I think there's room for that. I think we have to be careful to not take the, the volunteerism out of it. You know, in my experience, most people provide care lovingly and willingly, and we shouldn't take that away. We shouldn't make it a commercial transaction. But that being said, in some instances, we should be able to recognize that people are doing work instead of other work, and we have to compensate that. So I think we ne need better leave strategies. I think we never need better EI policies specifically for caregivers. You know, having a tax write-off when you have no income is not useful. So again, you have to be careful about having the right policies to answer this, the, the problems. We have to write, have the right solutions. And I, I find a lot of our solutions are kind of hand-fisted and, and not too thought out. Uh, I'm a big supporter of, you know, having, giving people independence for their caregiving. So instead of, you know, we have all these institutions and they cost money, but allocating the amount of money and saying, listen, you can, Take, you can use this the way you want. If you feel you need an in-home uh, person to come five hours a week, uh, or maybe you need someone to take your kid to the mall, you know, to give you a break, some respite care, the, you should have that flexibility. So are these programs that exist, that Alberta has a great model that can be used. Now, it tends to be only used by families of, of children with disabilities, but I think it can be extended to, to elders as well. But there's a recognition, too, that not everyone can do this. The, the uh, administrative burden of doing it is really onerous. You know, I remember in my book, I have a story of someone who hired, a, you know, had one of these plans, hired a caregiver, but then she had to create a corporation to be able to pay, uh, you know, vacation pay to her caregiver. Well, nobody wants to set up a corporation. That, that's not that's not what we need. That doesn't make things safer and it doesn't make it better. So we have to, there has to be this flexibility. Uh, this is not a business, this is caring. And yeah. there's a business element to it, but let's let's find that the happy medium there. Yeah, and I think central to making it usable and um, not, you know, a whole other full-time job to do the paperwork of having a personal budget for health in your family would be that there would be some trust that this is not a scam, right? Um, you know, I remember being on a committee, this is a long time ago, um, but it was the very first um, committee that put together personal budgets of any kind in Ontario for children with disabilities. So it was 30 years ago. And I remember there was a senior health official at the table who said, but what if the parents, what if the mothers, because it's always about mothers, what if the mother buys leather pants? And I just, I could not believe that this guy said this because my life is looking after someone with 24 seven awake nursing care needs. And I just thought, are you kidding me? Um, so I do think there needs to be, and there's plenty of evidence now in terms of poverty reduction that people, if given a, um, a basic income, for example, buy what they need, um, with very few exceptions. So yeah, maybe there needs to be a little bit of basic trust too, between, um, the government entities that need, um, I don't know, accountability, that 12 hours of paperwork doctors yeah. are doing. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And I think, you know, we have to start with the premise. The reality is most people ask a lot less than they need. It's not the opposite. There's very little scamming. And if there is, that's easily dealt with. That's a totally different issue. But that's the reality. The reality is most people bend over backwards. They work themselves. 
literally to death sometimes, and they don't ask for much. So I, I think, yeah, this whole attitude that we're going to get scammed, it's, it's just doesn't hold water. And I noticed in the chat, someone I should have mentioned, Newfoundland does have a very good program for uh, compensating family members. Uh, now, they have a real serious labor shortage, too, but that's one way they've dealt with this. And it is a good program, and there, it isn't scams. People get do take really good care of their loved ones, and they get a little bit of support, to sort of like an EI type thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's wonderful to know about these, um, you know, optimistic lights in different parts of the world, in different parts of Canada, where we can look at these hyper local, wonderful programs that are working really well for neighborhoods and people. Uh, and and it, it's kind of informal support that's organic to where people live. And if we could somehow bottle that, but I think some of the energy, for example, at the Canadian Center for Caregiving Excellence is about bringing some of those examples together and trying to figure out how to scale them. Um, yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I wonder if we can, if I can ask you, <laughs> this question really um, just kind of touched my heart. It was from Joanne. She asks, how will family caregivers ever cope? Our governments at all levels have abandoned us to do unpaid healthcare work. It's so hard. And where can we find hope? Where can we find optimism that it won't be so hard, that we haven't been abandoned? Where can we find some evidence that we're not abandoned? Yeah, I think we have to find hope in places like this where, you know, hundreds of people have gathered together. They're sharing this wisdom. Just having a little basic support goes a long way. It doesn't substitute for not having uh, the caregiver available or for having money to eat, but but it can get you through the day sometimes. So I think, I think there is reason to be hopeful. Uh, I think the other thing is we have to keep hammering away at policymakers. The reality is and politicians. The reality is they have mums and dads too. Uh, nothing changes a politician's mind faster than their father having dementia. And I can tell you, I hear from politicians all the time because I hear from, from families and then, you know, they're all of a sudden in, thrown into this, like we all are, it just happens suddenly often. And then what do I do? And I say, well, you do like everyone else. You start phoning around and you hope and you pray and you use your contacts. And then you bother your fellow MPs and you tell them to do better because you shouldn't have to go through this. So I think there, there's a lot of this. It's just uh, seeping into society. This is the new reality. And it's a reality that's that's failing us. So we have to we have to poke away at it. I think there's a lot of good stuff going on. Uh, COVID was a horrible, horrible thing, right? 53,000 Canadians died of COVID, half of them in nursing homes where 1% of the percent population lives. It's a horrific, this is one of the worst disasters in Canadian history. I hope we've learned from it. I think we're going to get better long-term care homes out of it. I hope we'll get more home care. I hope we'll get more programs to support caregivers in the home. I hope we'll get more free training. I think things are changing, it's not changing fast enough, but there's a lot going on out there. And it's, I know this, I know it's hard to be hopeful when you're up to your elbows in well, in shit, literally, sometimes, right? When you're in mm -hmm. the midst of it with a, a family member who's in distress, who's sick, uh, who you're trying to take care of, and it's beyond you, it's hard to be hopeful. But I think a lot of people are there to, to help out. Uh, they take their learnings, their hard-earned learnings, and they apply them to others and try and make it a little easier for the, the next, maybe for their neighbor or for their sister or for their loved ones. And and I think we, we have to just poke away at this stuff. We're in an era where there's a lot of demand on governments. They're not going to magically pump everything into this sector, unfortunately. But I think it is going to be top of mind. And we have to do that. I think ultimately, you know, people often ask me this. Why, why don't things change in healthcare? And I think it's because when you come right down to it, we, when we go to the polls, we don't vote about healthcare. We vote about 
You know, did somebody invite a Nazi to Parliament? Did, uh, you know, is my road not paved? Is the price of gas too high? We vote on very short-term things, and we have to have a little more vision individually. We have to be more demanding. I think one of the saddest things about Canadians is we're very accepting of mediocrity in our healthcare system, and there's far too much mediocrity, and we shouldn't. We spend an enormous amount of money. We're a wealthy country. There's no acceptable reason for our elders suffering the way we do. They don't in other countries, and we shouldn't shouldn't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of not tolerating it, there's a lot of people here listening this evening, and there are a lot of family caregivers in Canada and a lot of people working to support caregivers. Just even in our, um, I'm, you know, scrolling down, I know so many people who are here, and I see Sharon Anderson from the University of Calgary, or the University of Alberta, who's, you know, working on a program to educate um, healthcare providers to su better support family caregivers. There's just tons of us here who are working away at this, um, trying to make it easier. And I guess before we um, got going, I asked you, Andre, before the, the webinar started, do you ever get discouraged because you're such a great advocate? And you you said, no, I keep, I always have hope and I keep drip, drip, drip. And that's what we all can do for family caregivers. Like, I think the message that I just heard you say is that together we are stronger and we can keep um, boosting each other up and making a noise about the issues that concern us most and um, caring properly for easing the suffering of people we love. This is basic. <laughs> And uh, that together, we should not accept anything less. And that is a fantastic message to end on. So I just want to thank you so much, so much for uh, a fascinating conversation and also an exhilarating one and a hopeful one. Um, and I really look forward to hearing your keynote at the upcoming Canadian Caregiver Summit too. Um, over to you, Christine, um, and thank you so much again, Andre. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you Andre and Donna. Sorry, I'm I'm just trying to facilitate so so many things in the chat and in the uh, and in the Q and A. Uh, so lots of people asking about the caregiving essentials course. So it is a free course, as, as Donna was just saying, um, Sharon out in University of Alberta, out of U of, um, U of A is trying to put some, or has put stuff together. You know, we need resources and McMaster has this wonderful resource for people. It's free, Donna is the facilitator. It's asynchronous. So you work at your own pace. You log on, you do the modules, you take the quizzes, and um, there we're offering micro-credentials. So if you do so many quizzes and you get a certain mark, then you can get a micro-credential in that caregiving essentials. So if you're feeling that you want to boost your caregiving knowledge, you know, sure, why, why don't you try it? It's free. Um, and these webinars that we run are sort of to help um, complement the material that Donna goes through. And there are many, I'm gonna ask um, Shelly, so Shelly helps run these webinars. I'm gonna put, ask her to put in the chat, the list of the uh, YouTube channel. So you can see all of the previous webinars that were, have been run over the last year or so. And in the chat, someone had mentioned uh, the waiting, what is, um, oh, the waiting room revolution. The waiting room revolution. So people who are familiar with the two McMaster um, researchers, Samantha Winemaker and CNCL, Dr. CNCL. Uh, yes, they have a, um, a webinar. No, sorry. They have a website and they have a podcast. So I can they have a new book too. And a new book that just came out this fall, right? I think yes. it just came out. It's called yes. Hope for the Best and Plan for the Rest. And it's wonderful. So I am going to put in the chat here. Sorry, everyone, because I didn't give this to Shelly. Here is the waiting room revolution. I've just put that in the chat if you're interested in um, that one. Uh, 
So I've mentioned a couple times now, this webinar was the first one to kick off the um, Caregiving Essentials course. The next one coming up, normally, for those of you who have joined us in the past, normally we have our webinars sort of during the lunch hour. So this was a special one with Andre. The next one is October the 18th. So let's put, I'll ask Shelly to put that information in for people if you want to register for that. Uh, it is about a very sensitive but important topic. Talking about death won't kill you. Conversations about medical assistance in dying and more with Dr. Kathy Cortez Miller. She's a best-selling author and associate professor in the School of Social Work and the director for the the director of the Center for Education and Research on Aging and Health at Lakehead up in uh, Thunder Bay. So we encourage you if you have time and you want to join us for that. And if not, if uh, noon hour doesn't work for you, feel free to still register and then you can watch the recording because every time you register, you will get a link to the recording afterwards. Um, I think I have also put in the... I put in the summit, so everyone has that. The YouTube channel we have put in, I'm just making sure, I think I have covered everything. The course opens up, the registration opens up Tuesday, October 10th. And, oh, I put, I didn't put um, Donna's book. Like I said, we will be giving away some books. So let me just put the links in. Me may, may not want to buy them until after Monday, but if you're interested, I'm going to put the Indigo links in there to help support Canadian publishers or I guess they're retailers. So I think that is all I have to say. Have I missed anything, Donna? No, not at all. You did a great job, especially since you're in France and it's one o'clock in the morning. Well, it's now two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, oh, you can goodness. see the bags under my eyes anyway. <laughs> oh, go to bed. <laughs> I will go to bed. So thank you, everyone. We we had such a, a lively thanks to everyone for sharing in the chat. Uh, great conversation there. People were able to, you know, use each other as resources. That's one of the best things about these webinars. That's why we encourage people to come here and bounce ideas off one another you know it takes a village as we know because our government is shirking their responsibility so it is falling on the shoulders of the everyday person so with that i will thank andre who's in my corner down there for joining us donna for joining us shelly who is uh, working behind the scenes and of course to all of you who have taken an hour out of your evening to join us. So thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again in October or November or whenever you can join us. Um, we appreciate your support. Thank you everyone and have a great evening.